Hi, my name is Bruce Tarrant. I'm a Level 5 LTA Accredited Plus Master Performance Coach, which probably sounds a lot better than it is. I've been coaching tennis for 34 years. I started in a small three-court club in London, then a small seven-court club, then as head coach at three quite substantial tennis clubs over 26 years. I've always been a head coach, working within clubs in charge of coaching. I was a Middlesex County and South East regional coach, as well as running large-scale junior programmes, I've also produced a large number of county and national juniors. My clubs have always done really well. I see my tennis club as my football team. I identify with it and want it to succeed. I came to Newmarket just over three years ago. The club was in a long-term decline. I needed to make an income for myself, but I've always believed that the better the club does, than the better than coach can do. And anyway, I've always loved tennis clubs and get a big kick out of seeing them prosper. And at my age, new market will presumably be my last club and I wanted to end my career with a positive contribution. My job was to halt the decline and turn it round. I did this by using strategies I've learned over 52 years of being at clubs as a player, a coach and a committee member. And by the way, this is the first tip the coach has to be a full member of the club committee. I've been lucky to have a committee that in my first three years never voted down a proposal I suggested. Not all of these strategies will apply to every tennis club, but some will, and I hope this video may prove useful to anyone, whether a coach, a chairman, or a committee member who wants to genuinely move their club forward. A supportive chairman helps. At Newmarket, I've had two who both fall into this category. I give my thanks to them, to the committee, and to the members and coaching pupils at Newmarket Tennis Club. So here we go. How to turn around a tennis club and completely transform it in every way in just three years. I'll start by briefly describing the club I came to three years ago in 2017. For my job interview, I ended up in a nearby jockey club. This was normal evidently as the tennis club had no sign outside the entrance. On entry, the first site was a neglected green tarmac court, rutted with large cracks covered in slime with weeds encroaching, and a net hanging down and full of holes. It looked derelict and depressing. I walked around by some sloping concrete paving covered in dirt and a white fungus. The clubhouse building was large with character. Upstairs was dark with bulbs not working and paint peeling from the walls. The furniture looked decades old. There was a notice on a window from 2004. Photos of the club's glory days hung at random. The newest was 20 years old. Most were much older. The interview was in the kitchen as no one knew how to work the heating. The oven was used to keep warm. Milk was brought in because the fridge didn't work. A metal balcony looked out onto the courts. The balcony floor was a mixture of rust and slime accessed by a sliding door so old it wasn't attempted. The other sliding door had a sign saying not to open. The whole thing had recently fallen back and nearly crushed someone. There was a bar next to the kitchen, neglected and dark, with loads of glasses, but no stock. The lock to the bar was stiff through lack of use. Plant growth dotted the inside of the court fencing when we went outside. The cement bank hadn't been cleaned and you could see where the scum had washed out onto the court surface. The surrounding spaces were overgrown and neglected. There were a number of notice boards, but all were empty except for a water-stained newspaper story from a year before. The previous coach of 15 years was leaving to set up close by. Membership was low and declining and this wouldn't help. Club funds were small, although little had been spent in maintenance for years. There was a plan to close and gut the upstairs clubhouse and bar and turn them into a private apartment. There were seven hard courts, although two were unplayable in the wet and one was just unplayable with a plan to reduce it to a car park. The club had been on a downward slope for years. My job was to be a catalyst to halt the slide and reverse it. What follows is the timeline of how it was achieved and the strategies used to make it possible. A great start was in the dilapidated clubhouse where committed members cleaned, painted the walls, donated furniture, moved the photos and generally constructed a much more welcoming space. In addition, the slippery and dangerous metal balcony was scoured clean and covered with artificial grass to put it back in use for everyone. 
Membership was small. Pupils apart, I could go all day on a Saturday without seeing a soul. One month into the new membership year, the club had just 36 paid up members. Only two were juniors. One of the members told me the only time the club had ever contacted him was to ask for membership money. I set up mailing lists with MailChimp and added all mails of current and previous members to let people know things were now happening. I initially sent out a lot of emails and the response was so positive. My first newsletter had an 81% open rate. As email addresses come in, I add them to the list. From zero, I now have way over a thousand subscribers. I use MailChimp to push club events and membership offers alongside coaching. It turned out Newmarket had an existing but tiny Facebook page that hadn't had a post for years. I asked everyone, but nobody knew the password, so I had to start a new one. Starting a Facebook page is simple. I did the same at my previous club, but the commitment is in the photos and the regular posts. The secret is to update content a lot, interact with followers and take loads of photos of members. A busy Facebook page is a financial asset to the club worth thousands of pounds. In three years, the page now has nearly 600 followers, far exceeding numbers for most clubs. Facebook is great for marketing, both paid and organic. It also works as a club notice board. Instagram too, strong social media is a genuine asset. In my time, I must have run 50 Bank Holiday American Doubles tournaments. An American tournament is where you play doubles for three hours with different partners and add up personal scores to find a winner. I ran two in the first two months. The weather was perfect and every court full with members waiting off. Having not had one for so long, people were crying out for a social tennis event and were hugely appreciative. They were a lot of fun. I turn up two hours early, make the sandwich and put out some snacks. I buy prizes for the winners and runners up and ask a committee member to do the presentation. I hold American tournaments through the year, including Easter and Christmas. I played in my first American tournament when I was 14 and I feel like I spent the rest of my life arranging them. As the club started buzzing, it was great how people became pleased to contribute their time, but the club needed so much doing and most of it required money we didn't have. The club needed members, so an open day was essential. You have to get a good attendance or an offer a good time. The tough thing is getting in punters. Honestly, my experience of open days was mixed, but I'd recently been at a club where we totally smashed it, so I copied those strategies. A great looking poster and leaflets to pass out. Ladies Captain Helen took in the design and had leaflets printed. The best tip was getting these made and banging them into the ground at the six busiest points in the town. Outside Tesco was a winner. Next thing was Facebook advertising, paid and organic. I encouraged organic Facebook growth by taking photos of members holding up the posters. It also reminded the members holding up the posters. I did loads of them. Loads and loads. Never too many. I got a story in the local newspaper advertising the new regime and pushing the open day. The weather was great and the club really busy with 80 visitors. We asked them all for their email address to go on my MailChimp list and took memberships on the day. The best thing was all the club members who helped. Here are some great volunteer coaches. Members welcomed guests, wrote down contacts, processed memberships and helped the coaches. They were all great and the bar was open. Next year, we had another open day, more Facebook ads, more helpers, more volunteer coaches, more great weather, and lots of guests again on the day and the bar again. Simple strategies to attract the guests and then a well-organized coaching experience on the day with so many wonderful club members giving their time to help and great weather. The existing membership forms were on a large sheet of paper filled with small type. I devised a simple half size membership form just for juniors and the committee agreed to a low membership fee of £20 for under 12s. I handed the form out at every junior coaching group and as the coaching numbers improved, so did the junior membership numbers. By July, the club still only had three outdoor members. For seven months of the year, often only one outside court was playable. So to increase membership numbers, I recommended a £50 outdoor membership offer over Wimbledon. 
I did a big push on Facebook with a paid promotion, I sent emails and personally liaised with everyone who was interested in the deal. The 10 day Wimbledon membership drive brought in 48 new members and £2,660 in cash. It was amazing. The lesson for me, people want to play tennis over Wimbledon. Combine this with a very special offer and some marketing and a club can pick up a lot of members. But it was very hard to market the club when nobody could find it. I thought it was essential to get a big sign outside the entrance. When it came, it was just perfect. People could find the club and the sign also worked well as advertising for passing cars and pedestrians, day or night. The club also put up a sign for me at the entrance, something I really appreciated. The bar was unlocked and dusted off. Stock was mostly non-existent at first, but grew quickly with new inspirational bar secretary, Carol. Finally, with the clubhouse looking better and the heating understood, it was a chance to resume social functions after a gap of some years. The first was the American Bank Holiday Tournament. There was a barbecue on Wimbledon finals day in support of a membership offer. But the first non-tennis social function was a music quiz. It was super that so many people came. One of the first things I was told on coming to the club was that Newmarket didn't need a clubhouse because Newmarket members weren't interested in social functions. But the clubhouse stayed open and regular social functions returned to Newmarket. Social events bind the club together and give a sense of community beyond the tennis courts. What a difference. Vital to the resumption of social events was the reopening of a bar, with new bar secretary applying for a bar licence and taking the position of licensee. Carol also organised and promoted social events alongside social secretary Shauna. Cheers! Any tennis club worth the knee name needs an annual club tournament. There were some wonderful old trophies behind the bar, but the last inscription was in 1999, the previous century. I reinstated and organised a club tournament. There were 15 events with juniors, adults and vets, singles and doubles. I bought inscribed trophies for all the finest and paid for them myself. My biggest tip for running a club tournament? Scratch anyone who can't make finals day. And make sure juniors and adults play on that day. Have a presentation at the end of finals day. Never give out any trophies early. In this way, you get a packed clubhouse and an amazing day. You also get loads of spectators because the juniors bring friends and family. Best of all, it binds together juniors and adults and makes them all feel part of one club. Adult and junior finals on the same day, it's a must. That first year, the bar stayed open and the finalists congregated together at the end for a celebration drink. It was a special day for the club. Entry numbers for first year were good, but nearly doubled for the second year, then took another leap for year after. I added events and was able to institute an entry fee to pay for the balls and the growing number of prizes. After three years, the club tournament is again a tennis club institution. Here are the finalists in the 2019 Newmarket Club Tournament. It rained most of the day and all the matches still got played. Well done to everyone. Here are our mini Reds playing in a club event. They got wet. I organised a parent-child tournament. I recommend them and they introduce parents socially to the club. Parents and children leave with great memories. Here's the prize giving in the bar. Tournaments for minis are always good. Keep them fun and everyone takes home something. The club also hosts an annual mini tournament for local schools, providing the courts for free. After the first lockdown, I organised a singles ladder. We had 60 entries and 200 matches played in two months. It was amazing how members of all ages really enjoyed playing singles. It also brought in new members who wanted to take part. I recommend it. Starting the club tournament has been really positive and all the others from adult doubles to mini red, but there's still big scope to expand our competition programme, especially for juniors. In its heyday, the club had seven men's teams, but when I arrived, there were just two and none at all in the winter. The ladies were a little better off with three teams entered, including a first team, which gained promotion to the top division that year. I wanted the club to have more teams. I took over as men's club captain and entered a men's team in the winter for the first time. I arranged team coaching for the winter and pre-season for the men's and ladies teams, which was well attended. 
plus general team practice pre-season for the men, while ladies captain Helen arranged the same for the ladies. After the team coaching, there's a chance to unlock the bar and chill in the clubhouse. Our winter first team won their division, and I added a men's third team in the summer and a second team in the next winter. All our men's teams won their divisions in winter 2017 and summer 2018, with a celebration in the bar afterwards. There had been no juniors in the, any of the men's teams when I arrived, and it was great to bring two juniors very successfully into the first team. It was a real highlight for me when Romeo, our excellent third team captain, fielded a team made up only of juniors. Ladies club captain Helen is also hugely supportive of juniors. For me, any progressive club will encourage juniors in the adult teams. Men's and ladies now field four teams each in both summer and winter, as well as various mixed and vets teams and teams in Norfolk and Suffolk League. The plan is to add more teams. At the start of summer 2019, the club celebrated six divisional titles in the previous year, as well as the men's first team. These included a new men's second team in the winter and a new men's third team in the summer. Success breeds success. All the captains were really committed. And in 2019, I entered our men's first team into the prestigious Grace Cup after a gap of many years. It was a thrill when we won the whole event. We were told the last time Newmarket won was 40 years before in 1979. All teams are important. Matches can be like cup finals for every team from the bottom to the top. But I particularly want the men's and ladies first teams to do well. If they succeed, it reflects well on the club as a whole. It is great for the club to have more teams. Matches of fun. Disappointingly, Newmarket wasn't fielding any junior teams. My first summer, I entered five junior teams at different age groups. Junior teams are a lot of work, but essential. In the event, it went well with two of our teams winning their division and two finishing second. And of course, this was another chance for some free publicity. Junior teams are now firmly a feature of the club. Parents are happy to help and team members have expanded. The club is on a big site and needs a lot of work to keep it looking smart. All work was done voluntarily. Volunteers were wonderful, but there was so much to do. I recommended the club pay for work to be done regularly, at least one day every week to keep on top of the situation. This was agreed. Honestly, I don't think anything has made a bigger change to the appearance of a club than this decision to pay for maintenance. Regular attention has made the club unrecognisable from the way it once was. Ken has taken it on and done a superb job. Ken has sprayed and dug out the weeds, cut back bushes and done all the jobs that needed doing. He even made some net measuring sticks. Cleaning off the stone banks around the courts had a big impact. It was filthy. Ken said it hadn't been done for years. What a difference. Although here it is two years on, one side cleaned of weeds and the other just about to be. A perfect example of why regular maintenance is so important on a big site to keep it looking smart. Gary is our maintenance manager. He's an absolute legend. Gary is an engineer by trade. He can sort anything. Gary sorts the electrics for the floodlights and the fans for the bubble. We had a massive water leak, expensive work on a clubhouse roof and much more. All my clubs have had amazing people doing the maintenance. They're a breed apart. The club was using second grade tennis balls for matches and mix-ins, costing over a pound a ball and not lasting much past a couple of sets. I saw USTA approved balls for 70p a ball. The price has gone up a little since then, but they are still great value and quality. The club uses them for matches and club sessions. I use them for coaching. The response from club and team members is positive and the club is saving £50 per gross on balls. Getting a buzz going around the club is good and stories in the local paper always help. Local radio is good as well, if you have it. During lockdown, I started posting videos on Facebook of our club members playing tennis in their gardens or front rooms. The BBC got to hear about it and we were featured on the local TV news. Notice boards tell you a lot. If I'm visiting a club, I always look at their notice boards to see how it's getting on. The new market notice boards were empty. I filled them and keep them updated, but currently they're full of COVID notices. So here's a board from a previous club. 
Everyone had to walk past court seven, which was really depressing. Money was tight, but it needed a clean. I contacted a local company and they did an amazing job. The guy who did it had never seen so much muck on one court. It looked a lot cleaner afterwards, but without the dirt, you could see the cracks more easily. But at least it was a little safer to play on. Court five and six were non-porous acrylic, which is slippery enough in the wet without all the dirt washing down from the banks over the years. Court seven had gone well, so we pressure washed the banking and courts four to six. Again, it was difficult to believe just how dirty the courts had been. My previous club had a load of advertising boards. Newmarket had an empty wall. I suggested that Newmarket try to do the same. We set the price low, it would boost the look of the club and any income was welcome. In the event, a mix of club members and local businesses stepped up and the empty wall got populated. Going forward, the notice boards now provide a cost-free income stream for the club and new ones keep coming. So we had to find another wall. For the UK, there's never been a perfect surface that combines club play and performance, all weather and soft on the joints with a slower, higher bounce to encourage topspin and allow juniors time to develop effective technique. And then there was artificial carpet clay, which is all of these things. Three years before, without an increase in membership numbers, the club had no future beyond its then current state and further reductions in membership might have meant the club having no future at all. Instead, membership numbers had quickly more than doubled and largely financed the scale of positive change talked about here. Although income is definitely not an indicator of a club's continued success, the most important thing remains good decision making. And so I'll move on to what is the most basic decision for any tennis club, the provision of its playing facilities. And in our case, this was to do with artificial clay. I came across it at my old club, which eventually laid 12. It's an ideal surface for playability, long life, performance coaching, and old limbs. I enjoy coaching on it, and I love playing on it. At Newmarket, a top quality carpet clay was my number one ambition for the club. But given the club's finances, I wondered if it was just a dream. It was at my second AGM in April 2018 that I talked about it as my personal vision for Newmarket. I told everyone how great my experience of the clay was. Nearly everyone at Newmarket was positive and the club made it their long term goal. I was grateful for their trust. We formed a subcommittee to look at court development. Mike, our excellent club treasurer, put together a financial plan to consider when and if we could put clay on courts four to six. We also discussed court seven. Should we resurface in tarmac and then lay clay on top as an interim measure? I got in touch with three companies I'd had positive contacts with in the past and asked for various quotes. There had been no court development at the club for 12 years and I felt Newmarket needed a positive statement to show we were moving forward. After consideration, we decided to resurface Court 7 in Tarmac and put clay on a temporary back burner. I stripped down the three quotes to make them like for like and sent to committee members. The company did a good job and the court turned out really well. The work was a huge boost for the club. Here is Treasurer Mike signing off a successful job but by far the best thing for everyone was never again having to see the derelict state of Court 7 every time we walked past it. The only disappointment was the late season, meaning we had to wait until March for the court painting, but when it came, it was worth it. I previously asked the committee to vote on the best colour. They voted for red with a green surround, which was fine by me. It looked so much better than the two-tone green on the other courts. And a big bonus as well, the club has two banks of three courts, but the fencing between it was tiny. Any shot with topspin was in danger of clearing the fence and disrupting play. One of the contractors I'd spoken to was surprised at the minimal height of the fence and recommended a cheap remedy. Gary and Ken strung some netting above the fence attached by plastic ties to the light stanchions and the problem was solved for almost no money. With Court 7 laid and painted, forts turned back to artificial clay. A, play, a plan was put in place to raise the money required overseen by committee member Phil. 
Club members contributed some major sums. Interest-free loans were also achieved from members and Suffolk LTA. Along with funds from increased membership numbers, things were looking good. The icing on the cake was a substantial grant from Sport England. It even included additional money for new LED floodlights. It was very well done by Phil in overseeing the funding application to Sport England. It proves how vital it is for any club looking for project funding to take time to pursue free money. The rewards make the effort essential. In the meantime, one of the contractors had earlier mentioned painting courts 1-3. to three. The price sounded good. With the onset of lockdown, I wrote round to suggest we bring the painting forward. My experience in the distant past was that painting on top of already painted courts could make them slippery, but times have moved on. Start with a binder course and then two layers of top quality non-slip paint. We unanimously decided on the same colours as court 7, the courts look great and play like new. The whole look of the club has been improved without spending a fortune. The last court development had been 12 years before, when a single court 7 was left to deteriorate while Court 4 was resurfaced. The club has since saved Court 7, but the clay was a larger project and over three courts. I've been banging on about artificial clay to people pretty much since the day I came to the club. The playing characteristics are great and it's playable in all weathers, or pretty much. To be actually getting clay so soon was a bit of a dream and being selfish, I'll be out of practice on it myself. I recommend Grand Lano Clay, the only ITF grade one speed carpet, and in my opinion, the best on the market. The choice of carpet is important. Paying for an inferior version is a false economy. There is a need for some maintenance. We added a second-hand lawnmower to the bill, but saved money by making very effective drag mats from the carpet offcuts. Members should drag the courts themselves after every play. It was such a good feeling to be actually standing on three Grand Lano artificial clay courts at Newmarket Tennis Club. The reaction has been hugely positive, even in rainstorms. It's all good. And what a wonderful view. When I came to Newmarket, the club was planning to turn Court 7 into a car park. While upstairs, the clubhouse was to be converted into a flat. A new coffee machine between the toilets downstairs was to be the extent of the club's social life. I love tennis clubs. They're special places held in trust for the members for the future. Not just for today. Selling off club land, discarding courts and destroying facilities are acts of cultural vandalism. Losing Court 7 to a car park would have meant a tennis court gone forever. Each court in the club can mean 40 members, that's £5,000 a year, and a lot of tennis never to be played. Courts are sold to resurface other courts, and 15 years later the money's all gone, and the courts need resurfacing again. There is no course of study for tennis club chairman, no examination to pass, and tennis committees continue to sell off club land and diminish club facilities. Why don't they instead roll up their sleeves and use positive strategies to revitalise their club? And watch this video! It's scary to think how close it was to happening. Now every ball hit on court 7 and every good time has in the clubhouse, and good time still to come, is a credit to the new chairman and committee who three years ago, I think unanimously, turned their backs on this awful plan. Sorry about the rant. Anyway, here's a funny thing. When Court 7 was resurfaced, the bushes were finally cut back to reveal a sign for Court 8, a piece of club history I save for the future club museum. Potentially the most exciting thing about the club was the bubble, three indoor courts for six months of the year. But to start with, it was so empty. Apart from coaching, occasional club matches and social club times, there was just a tiny number of bookings by members. I did an analysis of bookings to see where we might gain some income from renting courts on block book bookings, maybe to other clubs. There were entire mornings and afternoons with all three indoor courts empty. Weekends were almost blank of individual bookings. Even peak evening times were largely blank. A bubble costs money to put up, to put down and to run, let alone the capital cost of replacement. Without better use, the bubble was not economic. But fortunately, as the club moved back to health, the situation improved and it was such a relief to see the courts being used more. As membership and enthusiasm increased, court usage doubles and then tripled. 
but bubbles now out for seven months a year, the courts are busy and members are booking tennis courts. I believe that often it's the small improvements in the club that matter most because over time they add up to one huge improvement that you hardly even noticed. The old star stair carpet was held together in places by black tape. Chairman Carroll proposed new carpet up the stairs and through the lobby and the ladies changing room. I recommended a basket in the lobby to put club balls into after play. Now members always have balls to use. The club was left locked so only members with keys could use the toilet. Not very welcoming. I wanted a combination lock, but maintenance man Gary came up with a better idea, a key safe. All members have a combination and everyone can now use the loo. The club got an honours board, which after 70 years did seem a good idea. I paid for it myself actually, because how else could I get my name on the wall? And at the same time, we had some more smart furniture donated. In 2018, the club joined the LTA Club Spark online management system, which has proved itself an effective tool. It has a good court booking system and collates and collects membership fees. The website is basic but free, and Club Spark also offers emailing to a member's database. I now use Club Spark alongside MailChimp for newsletters and targeted news, and also for online booking of my coaching groups. Another hugely expensive cost for the club was updating fire regulations for the club and the bubble that had long been neglected. All the fire exits have now been marked and emergency lighting added. All electric sockets and product have been individually tested. The club had no television, probably because nobody used the clubhouse. We bought a nice one for Wimbledon. The very old, very difficult, potentially dangerous sliding doors in the clubhouse were replaced. They weren't cheap, but they're really nice. The trees behind Court Force the Six were taken down in preparation for the clay to stop so much rubbish dropping down onto the courts. With the club resuming social functions, we bought a barbecue. The club bought a defibrillator for the lobby and new first aid bags. The chairman organized a first aid qualification for members in the clubhouse. Got new scoreboards, each one paid for by a sponsor. Not my idea, but a good one. The club erected a safety fence along Court 6. With the club house looking better, more furniture was donated. Club member Andrew kindly decorates the front of the clubhouse with colourful pot plants and hanging baskets. What a difference it's made. A kind club member has installed security cameras. It's great for security and I can watch the club from home, day or night. Of course, many of these single improvements use the extra cash from rising membership numbers, but equally, when members see the club moving forward with consistently good decisions and genuinely doing the best it can for them, then many will be happy to contribute to the club. It's a real bonus. Hi, thank you for watching this long video. I love tennis clubs and I'm so pleased to be standing here in this wonderful, thriving, modern tennis club, as I've been proud to stand in all my tennis clubs over many years. How is it possible that such a super place was moribund and in decline for so long? How is it possible that so many tennis clubs across England decline while other clubs thrive? I think the first thing in any tennis club is to see the potential and be positive. And knowing that tennis is the best, cricket, golf, forget about it, tennis is the best sport. But still, it is a truth, tennis clubs go up and tennis clubs go down. This is less to do with facilities and more to do with people. People putting in time, as we now have here, a lot of people putting in time, but probably more important, the right decisions being made. There are so many decision points, each one of which will affect the direction your club takes, up or down, forwards or backwards, small decisions or large. For me, every decision matters. Tennis clubs tend to go up when the right people get involved and go down again when those people leave or when someone else comes in who knows better. You want your club to carry on doing well for as long as possible. So try to hold on to those positive influences as long as possible and I suppose most of all try to be one yourself. Good luck.